Hey guys, Vern Danke. Now I've been tempted to make this video for a while and it's not a video of something very easy to make, but it's something very important. When you decide to leave your home country, there are things that will eventually catch up to you. And so how we address those things, how we deal with them before we leave is really important. And so today I want to discuss that. So let's get into it. All right, so I found this concept, and the best way I can describe it is, I would like to call it an alternate reality. Now, before I came to the Philippines, I lived in the United States. My mind was constantly trying to project into the Philippines. What would it be like? Where would I go? Who would I be with? What would I eat? And, and I cycled this over and over in my mind for maybe a couple years but I could never really exist in that reality because I was in a different present reality. Now when I'm here in the Philippines, back there is a separate reality and that feels like the dream where at first the Philippines felt like the dream. So just remember that you can't exist in two places at one time. You can only be in the one. Even though you, you have so much time or experience back in the other place, you exist separately outside of that. And if you've never experienced it, it's, it's really a weird experience. And just believe me that uh, until you jump out of that loop, it, it won't really make sense. So today's video is titled, Before You Leave. Now, before you make this big jump of going to another country, my best advice is to try to mend some of your fences before you go, okay? You might have issues with a brother, with a cousin, with an uncle, with a dad, with a mom, whatever it is. Try to plant a seed in the right direction to fixing those things before you come here, okay? Now, I look at it like this. If I have some issues, it's my purpose to plant a seed but it's not up to me to make that seed grow. And I think if you can look at those issues within your family, within your life, in that example, then at least planting the seed will give you more relief later in life than not having done anything, okay? And so I'm gonna break into a story of, of my life and I have to go back to the beginning. So let's check it out. All right, so this story starts back with my father. My father never knew his father. My grandmother had gotten pregnant. She worked in a munitions depot in Fort Lewis, Washington during World War II. And she met a man there and somehow he pretended that they were married through an army chaplain. Well, she ended up getting pregnant, found out that he had a family already and what she had to do, right? So. She had my father and she moved to Barnesville, Minnesota, just this little tiny town, met a guy, married, and my father and her and his stepsister lived on the farm till my dad finished college and moved out. Now, the guy that my dad uh, had for a stepfather, he was very angry, alcoholic, verbally abusive, so in essence, my dad never had a role model of a father or anybody that really contributed to him in his life. And so his life was just withdrawing, putting his head into a book, eventually getting into alcohol, eventually getting into meth and anything else that he could use to medicate to not feel the present moment. So my first, my sister was born and then nine months later I was born and my parents ended up getting married and five years later they divorced. Now, my mother was with another guy and he was very abusive to my sister and I and he abused, abused us. As far as I was told, there were bruises on us and my sister was thrown down the stairs and I remember my head getting into the toilet being pushed in there as like a swirly and I couldn't have been more than five years old five to six, maybe even four at the earliest. I, I just don't know exactly the time frame, but that was kind of how 
my dad ended up getting custody of my sister and I because of the issues between my mom and the guy that she was with. And he was, of course, an alcoholic. My dad raised us in South Minneapolis, which is where we grew up with him in a single parent environment, and he became a computer programmer. So he had an okay job, and that lasted for quite a while, but early on he started his foundation into drugs. And it just progressed and progressed, and the more that he withdrew, the farther he became withdrawn. I never knew my father to say more than a few words to me, and he wouldn't let me join sports, wouldn't let me join Boy Scouts, and his answer was, because the people will come to the house. And at one point he was growing pot in our basement. And I just think he was too paranoid to let other people see that side of him and maybe feel that he would lose us or, or go to jail or something, I don't know. But that was my growing up. So I had this really dark, unloving existence as a kid. And it was so depressing that I remember at age 11, I thought I was just gonna die before I turned 13 because it was just so dark, so empty, so void of any love. And I, I was trapped. I had nothing in my life that could make me feel worthy or worth anything. I had no self-esteem. I couldn't talk to girls. And I just, I, I had zero talents. And I thought, wow, God, what am I gonna do? Am, am I gonna die like this? I, I have no talent. What am I going to become in this life? And I, I was pretty hopeless. It was a pretty sad situation. I think age 12, I started smoking. Well, 14. 14, I started smoking. And then I started getting high. And then I started going to the parties. And then I started to just not even care. And at some point, I didn't even want to do good in school because I figured, what's the point? My father, who went to college, got, you know, a college education and he lost his job and then he became a janitor. So it was just this really, really, really dark time in my life. So all the while this is going on, I don't know how, and I don't know where it came from, but I still had an unconditional love for this guy. Uh, I, I, I just, I don't, I don't know where it came from. I, I hated my life, I hated the things going on, but something in me still loved him. And as empty and void of a parent as it seemed that he was, there was, there was some love in there. There was some care. We never went without food. We always had the basics. We had shelter and food, but that was it. I mean, that was really it. So I felt like I had every reason to hate him, to hate my childhood, to hate everything about him. So at some time, it was so dark, I, I just cried out to God. I said, God, take my sister and I out of here. My dad does not deserve us. And within, I don't remember the time that I said that, but within a couple of years, it happened. My sister went into a foster home, and my dad ended up losing his house. The house that he was buying, he originally f was paying payments to the original owner, and he thought they were making the tax payment for the house. Well, none of the tax payments had been made for 10 years. And the interest on that had grown so much, uh, it was almost 300 times more than what he originally owned. That's how much the interest went up in 10 years. And so we ended up get, getting a notice on our house door that said we had to leave in 90 days. I was 15 at the time. And, and, and somehow my aunt and uncle found out about this and they called my, my grandma, my dad's mom. They asked me if I wanted to live with them. And this was without even talking to my dad or anything else. I'm like, yeah, I want to get the hell out of here. I don't want to live in this. And my aunt and uncle were always kind to me and they always showed me love and attention that my dad never did and that was All right, so my aunt and uncle take me in and I think I was staying with them for two weeks and then my grandma came down from Rossay, Minnesota and she brought with her a U-Haul trailer and so her intention was, well, my dad's gonna lose his house, he shouldn't have to lose all his things. So we packed everything we could in there and my aunt and uncle said I could keep one box of things. 
to bring to their house. And I had, I had packed my basement full of everything that I could find throughout the neighborhood. I would dra drag home toys and race car sets and everything you could think of. I, I, that was my way of medicating to try to drown out the sorrow in my life. I would fix broken toys, take toys apart and just kind of, uh, do whatever I could with my mind so I didn't have to exist in that, that darkness. And so I remember when we showed up with that trailer, I walked into the house and there was a pan of soup on the dining room table and it was still warm like he was eating. And I don't know if he heard us coming, looked out the window and, and took off, or if he ate some of his food and then he left just as we got there. I, I don't know, but that was, that was it. I never heard from him again. He never called us. He never wrote us. I kept the same phone number, um, at least in Oregon for 20 years. And I never heard anything from him again. And so I still had that love, that unconditional love for the guy. And I had that for the longest time. And after the dust kind of settled out, maybe four or five years, I'm like, where did he go? And I kind of would look for him. And back then they didn't have the internet as well as they do now. So trying to find somebody was mostly through a phone book or some kind of a phone directory online. There wasn't uh, find a person and all that to the degree that, that we have now. So I always kind of kept looking for him, kept looking for him, kept looking for him. I didn't have any idea where he went. And then oh, maybe 15 years after I saw a reference to his name in Wisconsin. And it had a number, and I ended up calling the number, and nobody answered. And then shortly after that, I tried again, and the number was disconnected. So, who knows, you know? More time had passed, and it seemed like I'd find another address for him, but it was in Madison, Wisconsin, and I thought, well, maybe he's in Wisconsin. But I never knew, because, you know, at that time I was living in Oregon, and it's, you know, three, four hundred dollar flight to go from Oregon to Wisconsin and then it's going to be a three day drive if I'm going to drive. So it's not a convenient trip to find these answers and to go to this ghost's house and see if he even exists. Through my life I had some moments that I wished he was there and I kept looking for him at those times and I just couldn't find him and so my desire, my love, my uh, drive to find him just kind of slowly kind of just faded away. Before I moved to the Philippines, I went through my divorce and I was selling everything off and I just wanted to get the hell out of the US. I just, I needed a break from all the stress that was going on the last year of my life back in the US, trying to sell all my things. And I thought about possibly looking for him, but I just, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't mend my fence. And so I had a window where I told myself in two years, I'm going to go back. I saved my tools in, a, in my toolboxes and I saved my Jeep. And I thought, okay, if I can figure out a way to survive in, in, in the Philippines, I'll come back and sell everything. I'll get rid of my Jeep so that people don't have to store it. I'll sell my tools and somebody else can use them. And so that's what I did. I went back there. I only gave myself a week's worth of time to get all this done. And when you go back, you, you, you waste about a day, a day and a half each way. So a seven day trip ends up being, you know, four and a half day trip it's not really a full seven days that you get to be in that, that alternate reality. And so I had a chance where I thought in my mind, am I gonna go and track him down? Am I gonna go look for him? I, it's like I had this, this conversation in my mind and I don't know if it came from above, which it probably did. And it just said, are you gonna go back and look for your dad? And I thought about it and I thought, well, I'll be in Oregon. I don't have much time. It's gonna cost me another three, $400 to try to look for him. And I don't even know anything about the address or where he's at or 
I, I have, it's just so vague, anything about him or a connection to him. And I kind of was leaning about not going, not going to see him. And I went back, I did all the things I had to do, and I got on my flight, and I came back here. And I remember when I got here, I thought, you know, I'm probably never going to go back there to look for him again. That went through my head and my heart. I had that conversation again. And when I got back, nine days after I got back, I get this call 32 years later that my dad had died and he was found alone in, a, in his boarding room. And I thought, that's how you're going to do me, you know? That's, that's, that's what you're going to do to me all these years. So, you know, I just, I thought about it and I thought, it's going to cost me another thirteen to fifteen hundred dollars to go back after I just got back and I thought no I'm not going to do it I'm not going to do it and years later I think about that those broken fences catch up with you and you live with that and that's not easy to do um, So you live with that. It's not easy to do. You're going to have some regret. There is no pain-free escape from your, from your brokenness, from your misconnections, from things that you don't try to resolve. If, if I had planted a seed and tried to look for him and done more things, uh, it would have made me feel a lot better. I would have felt like I did try, I did go forward, I did do a little bit more. Did he, did I owe that to him? Mm. You know, he still was my father. Um, and, and maybe it would have given him a way to ask for forgiveness, I don't know. But I guess the reason I made this is to tell you, try to mend your fences. Uh, because in the end, you're gonna pay a price either way. You're gonna pay for it somehow. It's, it's gonna creep back you're going to have something come back to you. If you have even half of a character or half of a personality or soul, it's going to come back. You're going to connect to that in some way. And hopefully it's in a positive way because you tried to mend a fence or plant a seed. Um, you know, and, and just overall life isn't fair. But if we can extend forgiveness, I think it'll pay off in the end. So, so that's my words today. Thanks for listening.